All right, I got a few minutes after 10, so I think we could get started. Good morning and good afternoon to our East Coast friends, and welcome to today's webinar, Strategies to Prepare for CMMC Level 2. My name's Mike Class, and I'm a reg registered CMMC um, professional here with Cam and IT. As a reminder, we'll be having one Microsoft webinar the second Thursday and one CMMC webinar the fourth Thursday of each month to keep you guys up to date on what's going on. And we hope you can attend. If you have any um, future ideas for um, future webinars, please let us know. We'd like to hear from you. Before we get rolling today, a couple housekeeping items. There will be time for Q&A at the end, so if you could keep your microphone on mute during the presentation, that would be great. I know many of us are still working from home, and we'd like to eliminate all background distraction noises best we can. If you have a question mid-presentation, please feel free to use the chat function or the raise hand icon, and we'll try to weave your question into today's presentation best we can. I will be monitoring. Um, we will be recording today's webinar, so if you're uncomfortable with this, now would be your opportunity to opt out. Now with that out of the way, let's get down to business. So achieving CMMC compliance is a journey with multiple steps involved. You have to um, accomplish CMMC level one before you get a level two. And for a few of you, you know, level three is going to be your ticket to, you know, compliance. Hopefully on today's webinar, you will learn what level of CMMC compliance you need to be at and um, what rules you need to follow and what you need to understand about, you know, your level of compliance and the rules around that level. Also, um, what is a GRC compliance tool, what, what it's used for and why it's important? And um, maybe how Cameron might be able to help you out on your journey to, to CMMC compliance. We have a few ideas wrapped in today's presentation we'll share. So please sit back, relax, and let's hear our president and CEO, Mr. Matt Katzer, talk to us today about strategies to prepare for CMMC level two. Please take it away, Matt. Hey, thank you, Mike, and welcome everyone. Yeah, this is really interesting because myself, I'm part of in the process of going for my CCCA uh, accreditation and exams. So as we go through the CC CCP uh, accreditation process, it's really kind of interesting on the dynamics and everything else. And so what I'm trying to do today is give you some, you know, really break it down into really the three things you need to do. And I actually come up with a simple one, two, three step approach to actually how to actually get to where you're going to make sure you're online. You know, a little bit about Camin for those don't know, we're a cloud first company and uh, we just found out recently, and we'll, I think we can officially announce it probably another day or so, but we'll be the fourth year instead of the third year running for Inc. 5000 and fastest growing companies in the US. We're also aligned with the DOD cybersecurity model certification, and we're one of the 52 partners in the United States that can actually offer the DOD subscriptions, GCC High and AOS Azure, Azure government. Um, I've personally wrote books. I have sold 280,000 about Office 365 and how to secure Office 365. So we have a lot of different ideas of how to actually get things done and what really makes business sense. You know, and you have to keep in mind that uh, even cam in as a business, we, as we take our infrastructure and migrate ourselves so that we're CMC level two and we go through our certification process, which can be opening up shortly, we have to basically make sure we put those necessary processes and procedures and policies in place. And we're using those of how we actually manage our other clients that are actually in GCC high. So there's a lot of there's a lot of fallout in terms of what happens with CMC, what you need to do, and how you need to do it. So it's a holistic approach that you have to look. It's just not your business, but it's your suppliers, it's your vendors, and how you do business in general. But, you know, as you look through everything, everybody wants an easy step. And yeah, there is an easy step. There's really three things you have or three decision points that you have in your CMC journey. Don't get me wrong. There's there's a lot of work you need to do. 
but uh, with a lot of us, when you're when you have this daunting task, it's like, how do you uh, eat an elephant? And the, the solution is you eat it one bite at a time. And this elephant at CMC level two is just what it is. And you need to actually know how to approach it. But before we actually go into the, you know, the how the easy steps, let's just put some background to understand the rules and why, so you can frame what happens and you can frame why certain decisions are being made. And if you look where DOD is coming from, this is one of my favorite slides, because if traditionally when you look at cybersecurity, and cybersecurity used to be this pillar that you would tie into everything else you're doing. Now, what has changed with all the nation state actors and everything else that's happened, it's now fundamentally as part of your structure. So you have to really look at your infrastructure. You gotta look at your tools. And you got to look at which tools you use and how does security is embedded to them. Do you use different third party tools or you, how do you actually use a single stack approach? All these things are important. We started our journey in CMMC back in 2019, stripping out vendors that are, we knew that were not going to be compliant. Now we're a MSSP, so we're a service provider to providing security service and security management. So it's really important that basically make sure that we as an organization have the necessary structure and infrastructure in place that meets the CMC level two uh, certification requirements. But let's go look at some of the rules in terms that we're all faced in. And I've kind of put like six key rules that happen. And if you go down and look at what's what going through the NDFARS, and I put this is all, if you haven't been at uh, the, the military acquisition site, this is where these are posted. But basically it started with, when you look at what the DFARS clause in 2019, when they actually put the interim rule out, and that's really set in place the CMC methodology and assessment framework. And the whole idea for this was protection of unclassified information within DOD supply chain. Now, if you go through pieces on it, what it really means, there's a lot of other rules you have to be aware of, like the 7012 rule. For instance, like when CMC came out with CMC 1.0 and 2.0, people say, well, we don't need to do cyber management. We don't need to do the monitoring. But that's not the case because the DFARS rule of 7012 basically for covered defense information and cyber incident reporting, which means that if you have CUI, you have to basically do this. You have to put safeguard mechanisms that monitor those type of things. So, and you look at some of the other requirements that you're actually faced is, in terms of what the 7019 notice. And Hall, this is, is saying that if you're a supplier, guess what? You're gonna have to do what we call a SPURS, a supplier performance risk system. So you basically look at a scale about, how, with the, the maximum starts at minus 203 to 110, and you rate your business, your environment, your infrastructure according to the scale under the NIST 800-171. Now, one of the other changes that happened and this is a clause 7020. What happened with this is when you actually go and submit your SPUR scores or when you actually have contracts now, the federal government now has the right to visit and access the facilities. And if you've gone through your latest CAGE code in terms of with SAM.gov, you notice a lot of changes. They're actually getting more touchy in terms of where exactly is your location? Where exactly is work being held? So there's a lot of activities going around to basically make sure that people are doing what they say they're doing. And they're basically, you know, and they're basically continental US based businesses. Now, one of the other, if you look at the other interim rules that we have, you know, the DFR 7021, that set the CMC date of October 1st of 2025. So that date hasn't moved that date still is in place, and we're still marching against that schedule. And so, and the key thing is gonna be that when do you see requirements in terms of CMC contracts? And then the other acts of the change is terms of how the NIST 800-171 Rev2 has changed in terms of protecting CUI and non-federal systems. So basically what's happened as you've gone through and do against the uh, NIST 800-171, 800-171, you now have the necessary pieces in place so you can actually guarantee protection of CUI, and that's controlled on classified information. So those are the rules that basically, that's what we all have to live by. Us as a service provider to our clients that are in the Defense Industrial Committee, 
you as suppliers in terms of your primes, in terms of as a subcontractor, or in some cases as a prime, you have requirements that put in your contracts. You have to comply with these. And that's what's going on. And that's where a lot of the confusion is, is what do I need to do or not need to do? Well, it's they've been pretty clear. It's just basically it's about us working with in terms of clients and working with folks like you to basically put the necessary processes and procedures in place. Now, some of the latest changes that happened from the, the CMC AB town this week, this past week, they had a they had a meeting the other day. You know, it's the voluntary assessment for a CMMC will begin next month. And there's going to be a rule affecting in March 2023, an interim rule that DOD is going to publish that basically is going to go in effect. And what this is going to change is going to they're going to modify the NIST 800171 from a SPUR score for a NIST 800171 requirement to a CMMC requirement. In the practical reality, if you're going after CMC level two, guess what? You're uh, basically doing a full implementation of NIST 800171. If you're doing CMC level one, you have a partial implementation. So they're going to clarify that. And this is all posted on the acquisition site. So the questions that everyone asks, and so that kind of sets the groundwork of what we actually have, and the questions everyone has, how the timeline has changed. Well, guess what? The timeline hasn't changed. Now, DOD may change this timeline with their interim rule in 2023, but right now we're still executing against this October 1st, 2025 date, where you basically need to have your ducks all lined up and in order. And you got to have the necessary policy and procedures and processes in place. And we're currently right here in the 726, where I put a kind of flag to see where we are in the system. And we're already seeing changes in terms of the, you know, in the industrial base. One of the changes that we've seen, for instance, is that DIBCAC is now going through the people that filed SPUR scores. And they're saying, well, geez, you filed a 110 SPUR score. They'll give you a call on Monday and they'll expect to have delivered a copy of the uh, system, uh, your, your system security plan by Friday. Now, if you have done all the right things and put all the pieces, it's not a big deal. But if you haven't put your basically, you kind of did everything on a spreadsheet and don't have your information locked up and put together correctly, then you're not going to be able to deliver that. And keep in mind that when you file your SPUR scores, you are subject to federal rules. You're subject to negligence. You're uh, subject to the Whistleblower Act. There's been a lot of changes, so you have to do what you're saying you're going to do, and you're going to have to prove to do what you're saying you're going to do. And that's going to change the way we're doing things, all of us. Like in our case is that when we actually handle clients that are in terms of the defense industrial community, we now actually go through and build the object evidence, prove that we did we uh, that we did what we're supposed to do, put the necessary controls in place so you have full documentation. That's what's going on. And you have to basically look in terms of your culture and look in terms of your company and see how you build the processes. Now, if you're one of these that want to wait until October um, October 1st of 2025 and try to scramble, you're not going to change your culture. You need to start this early so it doesn't cost an arm in the lake and you can slowly get the right processes and procedures put in place. And that's what we're going to talk about in trying to do a, a one, two, three strategy. For those that are not kind of aware, this is just understanding the difference of CMC 1.0 versus 2.0. For those that remember, 1.0 was five different levels. And what happened, there was a certification requirements at all the levels at one, three, and five. When they actually went to 2.0, they did a couple of things. They basically said that level one and two, this is all based on the NIST 800-171 Rev 2, and level three is going to be based on a NIST 800-172. So if you're going after level three, and there's only really the DOD expects there's probably about a thousand primes that are going to do this, they have to do all the NIST 800-171 and the 172. For the majority of the 200,000 that are going for level one and level two, those are going to be the NIST 800-171. Now, in the earlier DOD town hall they did in February, one of the changes they did, and they changed in the, in the model. They had this model of, do you have CUI prioritized? Do you have COI you know, non-prioritized? Well, that's all kind of gone away. What they have now is basically, if you want to do a self-assessment, 
they're doing a self-assessment for level one. Now keep in mind, DOD has the right to come in and audit everyone. Now their feeling is that, will DIBCAC or DM, uh, DCMA come in and do that? Or really, do they have the budget to do it? You know, there's different questions on that, but the pressure is going to be on the primes to make sure that the subs are doing what they should be doing. But if you're going after level two, you're going to have to go through a third party accreditation process. That's kind of the way the model works. Now, if you're going to level three, that's an interesting one. That's the one that DIBCAC is going to do the audits. So basically, it's you can't get a C right at this point in time. You're not going to have a C3PO do an audit for level three. You're going to have DIBCAC do the audit for level three. And that's how basically that's how the ground or the floors are being laid right now. So let's take a closer look at level one and level two and then figure out, OK, how do we actually get there? How do we actually do the things that we're supposed to do? Well, when you look at level one, really what it is, and this is more from a model that we use at CAMN, so you understand where we're coming from. We're pretty much coming to this from a Microsoft uh, viewpoint because our philosophy is as Microsoft goes through their certification in terms of Azure government, we want to be on the uh, tails to do exactly what they're doing to reduce our costs and reduce our clients' costs. So when we talk about CMC level one, we really are talking about doing 365 commercial. Um, Office, you're doing Microsoft 365 E5, for instance. So we have policy and procedures, and you're going to use a GRC tool. In our case, we use a GRC tool, and a GRC tool is a government risk compliance tool. And what it is is that we use a tool from FutureFeed, for instance, and that gives you a single point of truth so that now you have established a processes in the organization, how information is uploaded and how you can actually communicate to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And this is really in this world where we actually have distributed environments. This is super important to basically build something like that. And then the other piece that we did with our CMC level one, for instance, we have a DIY kit. Now we put the necessary policy and procedures together, but you can go acquire these things yourself and do it. It really comes down to more of what's the best way and what's the quickest way to get to make sure that you get through a CMC level for attestation. Because remember, that's what you're trying to achieve. So in terms of what we did to assist the Ds, we came out with a DIY starter kit. You know, have the policies, we have the plans, and we structure a one-year subscription to a GRC tool future feed, and we put a bunch of some, some compliance uh, consulting in there to basically help you to make sure you get the documents written right and do the necessary things. Now, you can use our tools or you can use your own and create your own because a lot, some of this material is available in terms of on the web that through Carnegie Mellon, for instance, the government subcontracted on it. You can buy compliance forge tools, you can buy comply up tools, all sorts of different things. The approach that came in taken because we're looking at a 365 solution is we tailored this for the 365 solution and we tailored it to follow the Microsoft footsteps. Now, when you talk about what you're trying to do at level one, this is known as a Microsoft placement. And if you want a copy of this placement and you don't see it, make sure you put the feedback form in, just fill out the feedback form, we'll make sure you get a copy of it. But what this feed, what this placemat shows you is on for level one, what are the things that you need to do? What are the things that you need to have policy and processes in place? Now under CMC, um, you know, level one, you don't have to do a lot of formal processes, but the reality is you're going to have to basically put these things in place and make sure you have done the right things, the organization, because keep in mind, you have to prove to do what you're doing. The only way you can prove you're doing something is to write it down and put a process and make sure you document the necessary thing. And then when we actually use this and put it into like a tool, in this case, a future feed, we actually do can actually get in terms of a compliance score. And the compliance score is important because when the interim rule starts coming out in 23, you're going to have to put this compliance score is going to be fed into it. In the short term, it's going to be your NIST 800-171 score, which is also get adjusted. But this is the type of things that you're going to have to do. So you have a level one, you put the processes in place and you put the organization. So you want to look at your organization and say, how do I make my company work on level one? And this is, and we get right down to it, level one is basic cyber hygiene. 
And if you get any type of, like you're going to cyber liability insurance renewal, all the questions you need to answer on your cyber liability are included in level one. I mean, basically you're gonna have to do this either if you do it for the DOD or if you do it to basically be compliant with your cyber liability policy. And the thing that you gotta keep in mind in terms of how things have changed is that if you have a, an event and that you have a cyber liability policy and you cannot prove beyond a reasonable set of doubts that you have implemented what you're supposed to implement it across all the systems as you attested on your cyber liability application, your claim is gonna be denied. So there's a lot of changes that happen in business. So this is not just happening in terms of the defense contractors, it's happening across the board. We have to change the way we're doing business. So as we look in terms of an organization, look at the business from a level one, what about level two? So we've got those things in place. We have our MFA turned on. We have our logging and everything else. And what's the big deal about level two? Now, I tried to find a visual that really would expect it. So I managed to get this redacted document. And you can tell it's redacted because the CUI have the line through it from the Inspector General Office to explain that if you actually have CUI material, it is in this format. And if you have documents like this, you will be level two. And typically when a redact, when you look at the document, you have things known here as it's controlled in terms of what, who's the organization that's done it, what part federal agency is responsible for it, you know, in terms of POC and the other information associated with those. This is a CUI set of material. This is a specified CUI. So the question I have for you, when you look at it, so if you have documents like that, where can you electronically store CUI in the cloud? Now, you have two choices. If we we're looking at 365, you have the commercial, Azure commercial data center, that's where Office 365 located, you have Azure government. So does anyone wanna take a, a vote, which one, and put it in the chat window. Which, where do you think you can actually legally store CUI? And keep in mind, CUI is only in continental United States. You can only be accessed by US personnel. So where do you think you can actually have CUI stored in the environment? Now, the only place you can is gonna be in Azure government. You cannot have, and if you're doing ITAR, for instance, you're gonna to have to be in Azure government. That is the way the rules are written and that's the way the law is written. So when you look at pieces of, should you be in GCC high or GC, you know, or Azure commercial, it comes down to the information your organization carries. That's gonna define where you need to go. Because if, and also it's not just putting stuff in Azure government. So, so we have some clients that say, well, oh, geez, I'll just get GC, GCC high and I'll be qualified for CMMC level two. No, that's the platform. You now have to look in terms of your policies, your processes and procedures and everything else you have and put in place and to make sure you do that. Now, when you turn on like going into CMC level two they, and you look at this placemat, it's suddenly changed. So what I've done is I've taken the DIY kit, use that as a base of it and say, okay, let's look at what we need to do in level two. So we have all these additional, you know, in terms of controls that we need and practices that we need to put in place. I'm still oriented around my MS365 E5. And if I look specifically in terms of taking what the DIY kit does, suddenly I go on a NIST 800-171, I now have, yeah, I have these areas that I did on level one I qualified, but I don't have the areas I have to do additional policy development and everything else. And that's the that's the secret is what you do, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to build the base to how you move forward. And that's really the strategy. So the real question is, what's the best way to proceed for level two? And keep in mind, when you talk about doing level two, you're talking about some other activities, too. You got to make sure your scoring is put in place. You got to make sure you scope that CUI document, for instance. Do you have name CUI in terms of the contract from your prime or from your con or from your as a sub? Do you have is that specified? Then you're going to have to basically look at the organization, and say how good are you? You're going to have to go through a gap assessment, 
And then these POAMs are basically documents or plans that you need to implement before you get an assessment. Now, keep in mind is that some people are under the impression that, well, I can have, you know, like there's in the old days, you can have a, um, a Windows 7 system and just keep an NC machine on it or something like that and not upgrade it. Well, guess and get an enduring exception. Those days are gone. Just like POAMs, POAMs are used to show that you're going to go through an accreditation, but when you actually go through your assessment, you can't have any POAMs, they have to be done. And if you're having CUI, whether you use CAMIN or another organization, you're gonna to have to put some type of monitoring process, process in place to meet the RUTS requirement under DFAR 7012. That's just, those are the rules we have, they haven't changed. And that's the important stuff. When you look at this stuff, it, everything is building on it. So there's an assumption that you're putting some things in place. So what do you really need to do? Well, you know, it's really, a, it's a one, two, three approach. You start with CMC level one. This is the easiest one. You're trying to get the foundational pieces in place. You look at the organization. Don't worry about the level two, put the organization on a level one footing then basically look at what you need to do later. So the first thing is start with the basics. Make sure focus on the CMC level one. Focus on building the necessary processes you need to place to make sure you have, to you addressed all the practices, you have all the domains addressed. And then in the CMC flow, what this actually look, the step one is what you're really trying to do, and you can use our DYI kit, for instance, or third-party tools, doesn't matter. You're really getting this foundational stuff in place. You're changing your business culture. You're making sure MFA is deployed on it. You're making sure all the, all the things, you're putting the right cybersecurity things in place. And that's a key part. So you go through this whole process and say, okay, get the organization prepped and get it taken care of for CMC level one. Okay. What's next? Well, you got a decision to make. Remember that document on CUI? You have a choice. If you're actually gonna be, if you actually have access in CUI in terms of specified CUI, you're gonna be in GCC high. So you have to basically look in terms of what your end game is gonna be. So you're either gonna be in 365 commercial if you're just level one, or you're gonna be in level two or GCC high. And that's a choice. So you, the question is, do you migrate early? Do you migrate late? What's the end game? And you try to look at it wrong from a cost standpoint, because come that come that October 1st of 2025, you need to have the process and practices in place for the level that you want to achieve. Now, when you actually go through and say that you're looking at your level one, this is where you're starting off. So you're getting that good base in place, and then you wanna to go to the next level. And so one of the decisions, like I said, is, do you stay in GC commercial or you stay in GCC, go to GCC high? Are you level one or are you gonna be level two? Those are the fundamental decisions. So step one, implement CMC level one. Step two, if you need to have, if your organization is gonna have specified CUI, you're gonna be in you're gonna be in GCC high. So let's take a situation. If you actually go in GCC high, what do you do next? Well, then you're on this part of the diagram now. So you built the foundation, then you're gonna to have to go through a scope, you're gonna to have to go deploy the technical certification, and you're gonna to have to go through a C3PO certification process. So you that's the way, that's the way it kind of the process actually work. So you're gonna implement it. So now if you actually looked at saying that, well, I know I'm gonna be in level two by 2025, by 2025, then I can actually make sure I'm on the right set of subscriptions. I can take my time and build out the technical implementation of all this, and I get the necessary things in place. And then the, one of the questions you have when you actually go in terms of looking at a level three, for instance, when you actually look at level two, we'll call a step three, you really have to decide what your end game is. Now I have my organization as a level one compliant, and I have to make a decision. Do I build the entire company as a level two, or do I build an enclave as a deployment? And this is an important decision because when you look in terms of what you wanna apply, what you're trying to do from a business standpoint, I put my CEO hat on, I'm trying to figure out how do I, how do I define my scope 
so that when I talk about the security protected assets, I talk about the things that touch CUI or potentially touch CUI, I can control it. And when I bring an assessor organization, I have a controlled assessment and bottle, so I basically have them in a certain area. And this is where it comes in place, so you have to use a GRC tool because you're gonna have to show that you have the maturity, you have basically the processes and the practices built on what you're trying to do. And if you take your time to build this, you'll make it. If you try to push this to the last possible moment without thinking what your end game is, it's gonna be a disaster and you'll find that you potentially lose contracts. So the process hasn't changed, it's still in this model because when you actually look at this session or the step three, you're trying to define with this certify, what, when you're actually gonna go through a third party certification process, how they're gonna look the organization. Do you wanna kind of restrict them into this smaller footprint or are you gonna have this entire footprint that you have? That's the questions you have to do and the strategic on the business. Now, if you're a small organization, you may want to put the entire organization in terms of GCC high. If you're a larger organization, you may want to basically uh, strip it down to who needs to know. And But then again, the org larger organization, make sure the even though you're not going through a level two uh, require, uh, certification for the entire organization, you're probably putting all the practices and processes in place for the entire organization, but you're just not on GCC high for the, those pieces that are not don't have access in those assets. And this doesn't really change in terms of the process that you go through. You're still gonna go through the scoping. You're still gonna go through this gap assessment. You're still gonna walk through you know, the processes on your policies and how they deploy it. You're going to deploy things like DLP endpoint, for instance, which is part of the MS365 E5. And that tells how you actually manage USB, how you do some of the other things associated with it. You're going to go through and deploy policy practices and policies in terms of access control policies. Those are the things you're going to you're going to do. And you're going to build those things. You want to build it into your culture. And they're going to use a GRC tool to basically store the information to get the pieces in place. Now, a lot of times people ask us is what the cost of this? And I just put some rough numbers in it from an idea to give you, and I surveyed some of the markets, what they have. So you have different things, and these are going to be all over the map, depending on the complexity of the organization. But you can actually look at, like for instance, we offer a DIY kit. You can actually get it on the web and everything uh, from different places and put it together. Um, if you're doing a technical build out for CMC level two, it runs in uh, GCC high, runs roughly about 15,000. If you're doing your IT policy and plans, the prices range from 25,000, I've seen about 40 to 50,000, depending on the organization size. And monitoring changes, you know, monitoring is that, how you do the monitoring process. Because monitoring is just not the organization that does it, it's the organization that you choose to do the, if you do it internally, or if you do another third party organization, they, if they're gonna go touch and become a SPA, they need to also be CMC level two because their requirements are very specific. If organization has potential to touch things, they're gonna have to be at the same accreditation level. So now you're looking at what tools you do and everything else. And at the end, it's this, what you're really are worrying about with all this stuff is you're trying to drive the cost down for the C3PO uh, certification. So, and you know, this is a good example. You're going in to buy something in a store. If you see the store where everything's all neat in rows, where everything's well-defined, you have basically, they have the necessary documentations or the certifications like fixing your car. If you have an organization that like, what's the confidence factor that you're gonna have if you see the organization that has all their policy and procedures and documents run through, you're gonna feel that the organization's run is, is very well run and sufficient. If you go into like fixing your car into a, um, into another uh, dealership that basically, you know, you have dirty floors, you have parts on the on the benches, you have, you know, um, you know, all sorts of tools laying over, nothing's really clean, oil spills and everything else. Do you have confidence that they're going to be able to basically fix your car? It's no different than everything else. We're all human, so we're going to make those assumptions. And what you want to try to do when you go into this certification process 
if you're going to level two and you're going to have to go through this, you're going to want to basically make sure you start putting the pieces together to make sure you can be successful to show that you have things under control and you have maturity processes and you have standards because it's about controlling information. And you have your, and when we talk about what we do from an IT standpoint or from what you will do in terms of stewards, in terms of building products for, you know, Lockheed or General Dynamics or whatever is working as a sub, you basically want to show them that you are mature enough in terms of how you can do. So if you're say you're going to do A, you're going to deliver A. And so there shouldn't be a confidence. And that's what you're trying to do with all this. So how do you move forward? And, you know, like I said, it's a really a one, two, three process. And the step one is start with something like the DIY kit for CMC level one. Go build the foundation out. Get those pieces in place. And then the and basically and find that is through um, SourceForge, excuse me, through Compliance Forge, Comply Up. There's a couple of different vendors. Build those IT policies, put the IT plans in place, get those things and necessary so you get it. So you get the right pieces. And if you're going to go to level two, you're going to have to select the right cloud because if you have CUI, you're going to be over here in terms of the Azure government. There's just the way it is. And if you're doing ITAR, for instance, you're going to be coming under the ITAR regulation. You're going to be in GCC high. There's just no, that's the way it is. And then the third choice you do is you basically say that when you build out the CMC level two, Follow the technical reference guide. I'm where Cameron is on the Microsoft CMC acceleration committee. So we actually reviewed and gave input in terms of these guides, in terms of what's happened. It's really targeted for the Microsoft 365 E5, and it's really set up in such a way to help you onboard to put the things in place. So you can get the technical pieces in place, but keep in mind, you got to write your policy and procedures and processes on top of those, which we can help you or other folks can help you as well. So really from a standpoint, it's really, it's not, don't make it bigger than what it is. It's like eating an elephant one bite at a time. You know, it's just easy a one, two, three, start with the basics, get the level one in place, make the decision if you're gonna be GCC high, or if you're gonna do level two, you're gonna be in GCC high. So you're gonna have to decide when do you wanna bite the bullet on that? And then basically start building out the GCC high against the level two technical reference guide. And that's really the secret that you need to do. Great, Matt, thank you. Excellent job as usual. Um, we had one question come in during the presentation from Mr. Bill Murphy. Excellent question, Bill. And Bill, what you don't know is Chuck kind of answered your question and you don't know probably Chuck is our lead compliance manager here at um, Cam and IT. So the key to your question there is you mentioned CUI. So the second you're talking about CUI, you're talking about level two, and yes, you do need a GCC high license to be compliant with CUI level data. So yeah, Chuck was right on in his answer there. And um, appreciate the question. If you have any more, please let us know. Yeah. Matter of yeah. fact, I'm sorry, going like for Matt. Yeah, and it's it's also you got to keep in mind when you actually do GCC high, you're talking about or using third party tools. We move for everything from different type of password security tools. We use Keeper Security, for instance. Why? Because it's a FIPS 140-2 compliant platform. You have to start looking at the tools you're using, the work you're doing. Is the tools basically are they fed ramp high? Is the tools on a is the data that's being stored in on a FIPS 140-2 compliant? Is it a FedRAMP service? All these things now, so you have to look at what you're doing and say, does this tool work? Does this tool not work? And that's why we went down the Microsoft 365 E5 route with GCC High and Azure Gov. So I was looking at the calendar when Matt was talking about 10-1-25, and uh, Monday is August 1st. So five more months this year, plus two years. Got about 29 more months and um, you will need to be compliant or possibly get your contract pulled by your DOD federal agency. So, you know, time's a ticking. I think, you know, getting rolling on this right now and getting started is a super smart thing to do. 
because as time ticks on, more people are going to panic and try to jump in last minute. And it might be hard to accomplish everything you need to in that shorter time window. So, you know, good on you for coming today and getting a handle on this and getting rolling on it. So again, Bill, great question. Um, I'm sure there's other questions out there, so feel free to unmute and speak up or please, you know, type it in the chat window and we'd love to respond to your questions. You know, there's different strategies you have too, um, how to get CMC level two. The key thing that you want to, the key thing that you have to do is um, you're going to have to figure out who you're going to use for your C3PO accreditation. Camin, we're not a C3PO and we don't, uh, right now we don't have plans to become one. We're more of a consulting organization and a licensed reseller. But you have to look into, as things get touched, there's not that many, there's only 24 uh, right now C3PO's out there that's been accredited. And there's 320,000 companies that have to going to go through a process and 200,000 of those are basically level two compliant companies. So if you're, this is not something that you expect to say, come, Oct come September 1st and pick up the phone and get accreditation. You have to plan it, you're going to have to start it, and you're going to have to figure out the right partnership. Is it going through someone like Edwards, Curie Solutions, the name of food, they're all published on the CMCAB board or CAS or somebody like that. You want to do one of those versus trying to go someone like a line or someone like, you know, you know, if you go to uh, some of the others that basically before you even talk to you, they want to check for $200,000. So if you do your job right, if you do follow these one, two, three steps, get the process rolling, you can do this in economical fashion and be aligned and, and basically change your organization culturally to make sure you're doing the right things. Great. So uh, we got another question here from John. Are those other options instead of GCC high? So really, again, it boils down to what kind of data do you have? Do you have FCI or do you have CUI? FCI is a level one. Um, CUI is a level two. So it really boils down to what kind of data are you handling? And uh, Matt mentioned it in the presentation today, but I want to mention it again. I mean, not everybody has a huge budget to cover their CMMC compliance requirements. So our option one there, the do-it-yourself kit, that is a great option for smaller companies that don't have a big compliance budget that want to do as much of this as they can themselves. And then, you know, let us guide you through it, help you with the more technical parts, and just, you know, let us be your oversight and kind of manage the overall CMMC compliance, but you're actually doing some of the work yourself and it can save you a lot of coin and, um, you know, get you certified down the road. And that's what this is really all about. So if you, you know, if you want more information on that, you know, certainly call us at the number on the screen there, or you can um, chat me or, you know, however you want to get a hold of us. We'd love to tell you more about our do-it-yourself kit and how that works and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when you look at things like the question is, is there other solutions for kind Azure Gov or GCC High? I mean, there is. We're, we're the approach that we've taken is that we know that Microsoft's a federal contractor. They're going through their own certification process. So we're basically looking what is the lowest cost way that we can actually get the get the right license mix and go through a certification process without trying to prove that all these third party tools may or may not meet what we're doing. So from our standpoint, yeah, GCC, because we have to do the same thing you all have to do. GCC high is more expensive, but I have a higher confidence that when we actually go through our assessment process for a level two is uh, uh, level two assessment for certification, we have a higher probability of passing because we have controlled tools. So it really comes down when you look at this, this is a business decision. You as business owners and you're feeding into your organizations have to look at saying that, what is the cost and where do you want to spend the money and how much do you want to do yourself? How much you want to leverage from third-party providers such as Microsoft and others? 
and how you actually drive it so you can get to the end result. So you don't lose contracts and you meet the assessment requirements. So John had another really good question here. Do DOD contractors need to, you know, support the required CMMC standard? Absolutely. And if you're the prime and you have subcontractors that are working with you, I would take control of that. And, you know, whether working through you or with us or a combination of the two, I would make sure you're watching them close and you're making sure that they're actually doing what they need to um, follow policies and procedures and get things right. Because the end result is you're going to be responsible for it. And if they're not following the rules correctly, you know, it's your contract that's going to get canceled. So that question actually gets asked a lot. And yeah, you definitely need to be monitoring and managing any subcontractor that's working with you under your contract. So great question, John. Yeah, and to add a little bit more, when you actually go through the CMC level two assessment guides, there's nothing there's something known, we said some screens and probably didn't make sense, known as SPA. That's a security protection asset. SPAs can be chained. So if you're an IT provider that basically has a laptop, that laptop and you're going into an environment, that laptop could be changed as an SPA device. So you need to put the necessary pieces on there. So in essence, you need to qualify for it. So when an assessor looks at what's going on, they're going to look at all the SPA devices that touch things and touch the organization and say, is this SPA device certified or not? Is this part of the organization under seeking certification, what we call OSC? Is it part of the OSC or if it's a third party, if it's a third party, do they have their own certification that they've gone through the process? It's kind of a weird area right now, but that's what it's called SPA chaining. So the best thing you have to do is you just have to look at everything. And like one of the questions came up is some people use like third party backup and where they're backing up information that is clearly CUI, and they're backing up into a third party system. While it's encrypted, they're saying that meets it. Well, guess what? It doesn't because the end results, the backup, even though it is encrypted, it's not stored on a, in a FIPS 140-2 compliant system or a FedRAMP high system. So all these things, you tools and all information you have as a service provider, and that's why we started this process ourselves in 2019, you have to really look the tools you're using and how you change and how you change your business processes. Hey Matt, John had a really good question at 1047. And this question gets asked a lot. So I was hoping you could answer it and elaborate on a little bit. Yeah, so one of the questions John asks is, can a third party IT company have remote access to a DOD contractor system? Yeah, this is what we're talking about as security protected assets. You can, the question is how you make the assets. So it comes down to what is the safe way to do this to actually the environment. Since we're talking about GCC High and Azure Gov, what happens is the best way to do it is you spin up a Windows 365 virtual workstation in Azure Gov that's under compliance of the parent company, and they use that to actually manage the entire environment. So in essence, what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the pieces on it. And then you as an organization, if you take your laptop and say that my organization is level one and I've done the necessary thing. And then when I actually access that Windows 365 remote device, I've actually put the necessary level two controls on it to make sure stuff doesn't come in. I can't take stuff off. You can't screenshot it or anything else. So you're meeting the requirements of it. And that's how you run a VDI. So you have to start thinking about how to protect things. You just can't run a, um, you can't have a technician anymore. In my opinion, you can't have a technician pick up their, you know, their laptop and basically wrote in, remote into a defense contractor system that's level two, because now you basically have a security risk. So the rules apply to everyone, and it's, it's called in the term specifically that you have to worry about is known as SPA chaining. That defines what you can and cannot do. Thanks, Matt. Great question, John. And traditionally, that's been a um, kind of been a hole 
in the armor prior to CMMC and a lot of bad actors got in like that. But yeah, they've definitely have plugged up that hole and know how to deal with it and know how, know what to look for, you know, how to monitor it, manage it, all that fun stuff. Access controls. Anybody else have any questions they'd like to chat or just unmute yourself and feel free to ask away. Going once, going twice. <laughs> Anyways, it's about um, 10.54, so maybe we should give you your six minutes back. Again, we um, really appreciate your time with us today. Look forward to seeing you, you know, on our upcoming CMMC webinar series. And yeah. um, if you have any questions, you know, there's a phone number there or just email us. And um, we'll be happy to answer your questions. And um, I wish you have a good day. Rest of your day is great and cool. It's been a little warm lately. And again, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.